By the way, I want to thank you for coming. I, um, I know Penn State is playing right now. That's uh, <laughs> one of the schools I'm pretty interested in, and there's probably many things you want to be doing today. So I'm thrilled that you're here and uh, appreciate it very much. And I love this school, so I'm eager to tell you something about my 30 years here. And this fellow here, I don't know what kinds of questions he's going to ask. I have <laughs> not seen them, so we'll see how it goes. That's fundamentally untrue. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to the John Whitman Keeler Theater. My name is Nat Tracy Miller. I am the middle and upper school librarian here at Cincinnati Country Day, uh, and I'm also an alum, class of 2005. So happy homecoming weekend to all of you. I hope you've uh, been able to enjoy a lot of the festivities. Um, this is the first in what will hopefully be an annual set of conversations between alumni and faculty members. Uh, it is also the first event in the new CCDS Speaks uh, lecture and conversation series, which will continue later this fall with um, a world-renowned apiarist, uh, New York Times best-selling author Aisha Saeed, and uh, Major League Baseball sports writer C. Trent Rosecrans, uh, all happening here in the Keeler Theater. So keep an eye out for information on that. Uh, but today I'm here with Merle Black, who has been in the history department here for over 30 years. Um, and we're just going to kind of have a, have a chat about your time here and your thoughts on the school and your thoughts on the profession of teaching and your thoughts on uh, the, the study of history. Um, so to, to start it off, why, uh, why did you go into teaching in the first place? You know, that's a good question. I know t uh, Tony at the opening convocation of the school, you said there were two reasons why teachers come back to teach at Country Day. I, I can't, I'm not sure that I remember exactly what the two reasons were. One was that you just enjoyed school so much that you wanted to come back and teach. And the other reason was that maybe it didn't go well and you wanted to come back and torture <laughs> students. Well, it, it, it did not go well for me in school. I mean, I was, I, I was somebody who, um, I never took a book home the entire time I was in high school. I never did any homework. My mother would say to me, uh, have you completed your homework? You don't have any papers. You have no books. And I said, yeah, I've, I've got it done. And uh, the school I went to is a public school. I'm you know, I, very much an advocate for public schools, but the school I went to and so many other public schools are underfunded, and I just could not commit myself to it. So I was just... A nothing as a student. When I went to college, then everything changed. We were given a, a book, at Leon Uris, Exodus, about the founding of the state of Israel, and we were given one week to read it, and everything hung in the balance. We're going to read this book or not? And I read it, and from then on, everything changed. I would go to the library at 8 o'clock in the morning. I didn't leave until 11.30 at night other than to eat and go to classes. And then at 11.30, in case any of you were worried about me, I had a couple friends that would appear, and then we'd go out and have some fun. So, um, but I would walk around the campus, and, you know, for the first time in my life, I had heard about people like Thomas Hobbes or Friedrich Nietzsche or Karl Marx or Winston Churchill. Believe it or not, I didn't really know much about Winston Churchill until I went to college. And I would just be in seventh heaven thinking about this. So I became a really dedicated student when I went to college, I mean, my parents didn't know whether I would survive in college. And um, lo and behold, I made the dean's list and they just were amazed. And so um, I wanted to continue on in education and teaching, particularly history. And I have to be careful not to just go on and on and on here with my uh, answers here. I, I wanna say something, you'll just have to bear with me for a moment. So when I went to Gettysburg, uh, there were two professors there, and I think it, there's always, that's always the case. There's a teacher that makes the difference. And I can't tell you how many uh, professionals, colleagues I've worked with here at Country Day who, who've made the difference in uh, students' lives. I mean, the Duns, uh, your father, Mr. Mil you know, Brock Miller, um, uh, just on and on and on, just fabulous people. Nick Saberna, who's here, taught for a while, and we, we needed him to come back here to Country Day. Uh, fantastic teachers. Um, so uh, in any event, there were two professors. One was Norman Richardson and the other was Charles Gladfelder. And Charles Gladfelder was the man I really worked with. He was a um, chair of the history department, 
one of two legendary teachers at Gettysburg for decade after decade after decade. This man, he, I, I would write in historical methods these papers for him that would go on for, some of them would be 60, 70 pages, and I'd turn them in and I'd get a comment back, and here he had written a you know, big line across the bottom of a page with one of my footnotes, and he said, it's pages 60 and 61. And so I went back to the library and checked my source, and here the last two words of the sentence went on to this text on page 61. And so he was telling me I had not done my references correctly. So then, to bring it back to country day, I wanted to teach, and it's, it's meant the world to me. And so I'm here at uh, Cincinnati Country Day. I've worked here a long time, and three years ago, um, I'm up in the dining terrace, and I'm getting some crackers before uh, the regular lunch, and I run into this young man over here. He's right here, Dima. And he said to me, um, who are you? And, you know, how long have you been at Country Day? We struck up a conversation, and uh, we became real close friends. And he has come to my class and taught the seniors about Russian history. And he knows Russian. His mother is Russian. Uh, but then we began to talk, and at one point he told me, I hope you don't mind this, Dima, that uh, he asked me, how old are you, Mr. Black? And I said, I'm 65. And I think you said, well, yeah, that's pretty old. <laughs> and so you went home and told your dad, and then his last name is his mother's last name. So he went home and told his dad. His dad then emailed me apologizing, no need to apologize. But um, what is your first name, sir? Andrew Gladfelder. So his name is Gladfelder. And so I asked, is this, are you related to the man at Gettysburg College who got me involved in teaching and my profession. And it is, it's their a direct relation. So uh, it comes full circle. And um, so he's a great young fella. And he's just, he, he epitomizes what's so great about this school. And that is that students are, you know, independent, uh, they're challenged and they're curious. And he is just, uh, uh, this young man is talked about in the middle school and the lower school lower school, and he's just, just such a fine young man. He's very typical of what we see here in Country Day. So I'm sorry if I, I hope I didn't embarrass you, but you're such a gentleman. You're such a great guy. Okay, I'm sorry I went on a little bit long there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so if you could start real quick um, with a, a quick description of your legendary modern history, uh, modern European history class that you teach in 10th grade. Um, and then tell us a little bit about how you put it together. It's, it's drawn from a huge variety of sources and it changes every year. How do you keep all those pieces in your head okay. and then construct it again every yeah. fall? So I, I'm really opposed in history to a textbook approach. I mean, you, you can get a textbook and it might have three or four authors, but you're gonna hear three or four voices and that's it. And, and many of these textbooks come packaged and so you'll have, you know, chapter headings in a certain color, then you'll have text in another color, and then they'll give you questions at the end, and then you can get a test bank, and it's just all so uh, ordered. And um, my perception of the past is that it's very difficult to understand the past and its complexity and its ambiguity and its richness. So what I like to do is I gather readings together and um, I mean, David, what were you going to say about me? That yeah, but you were going to say something else. It was some. David ran cross country today. We had a cross country race down at uh, down at Milford, and all the runners came away pretty pretty muddied. I mean, it's it's uh, and I mean, David's just a fantastic student in the uh, upper school. And you had something you were going to say about paper. What was it? You going to roast me and say something? Yeah, yeah. So I, I uh, photocopy a lot, and I, I, I'm so concerned. I mean, what would drive me out of teaching and what I have nightmares about is Tony Jacacci coming and telling me, no more photocopying. Um, so I like many different voices. I want students to hear many, many different voices to try to come to an understanding of what the past is all about and not have it be textbook. 
Um, because history is something in which we are eternally debating exactly what happened or what it means. There's always new questions. And so um, I, I'm the photocopy king of the school. I'm not proud of it. I don't enjoy doing it. I tell the students that I don't want to see any of the handouts, you know, in the bathroom, on the floor, uh, that they need to go home and build an altar in their, in their bedroom and maybe have a candle on either side of the stack of, of handouts. I, there was one year where the school tried to crack down on photocopying, and so we all had a number, and the number was to see, you know, who was photocopying, and they, they were going to say something to us about it. And um, Tim Dunn put his number up where ev all the faculty could see his number. So he was encouraging everybody to use his number. And then I was the only person that used my number, and we were going to find out at the end of the year, who had, did more, who had done the most photocopying? I beat the entire school. <laughs> so, Tony, I, maybe I shouldn't have, I think I've said too much. Okay, okay. So, yeah, to finish, I, I, so I revise every year. I have, um, I'm sorry, I have a spouse who um, doesn't mind <laughs> me buying lots of books. I buy incredible number of books. I mean, she said early in our marriage that one thing that wasn't permissible is that I have the books in bed. You know, so sometimes she'd come to bed early and there'd be 15 books in the bed. So no books in the bed. But, um, it, you know, I, I just, I love books. I, I appreciate so much the authors who, and the researchers that spend this time, you know, looking at the past, because if we don't understand the past, I mean, we're lost as we go into the present and, and, and into the future. And we have to understand, you know, all the issues. And whether it's, you know, climate change or whatever it might be, globalization, we need to understand uh, tribalism that's on the rise. We need to understand these issues. And we need to understand them in a way in which we don't divide people, we don't separate people, that we understand many different points of view. So I'm always revising my curriculum. I like to make it really messy, and then the students and I try to bring order to it. I mean, I really believe that in some ways, and I use this as an image, the course is a kind of a maze or a labyrinth. It's meant to stretch them. It's meant to make them uncomfortable at times. Um, um, the Kissinger boys, sometimes I think were a little annoyed with me, but then we'd go out and sort it out, you know, in cross country and track. And again, just fabulous young men. I just have to throw that in there. Just fabulous young men. And uh, so I really believe in um, that making it complex because it is complex and then we try to bring order to it. So I'm always changing the curriculum. Um, it's always fresh for me. It's fresh for the students. And we really arrive at understandings together. We even make up tests together. So I'm not drawing on some bank of uh, pre pre-prepared uh, test questions. I mean, we, it evolves organically in, this, in the class as we, both the students and the teacher come to an understanding of what it is we're looking at and what we're studying. And I learn an awful lot from the students. Uh, Casey, I learned a lot from you. We had a big debate about uh, gematria, which is the study of numbers and how it applies to uh, Gothic cathedrals. And uh, Casey just would not buy that Gematria has anything to do with the building of Gothic cathedrals. And I haven't forgotten this. I mean, you gave me a run for my money, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. It, absolutely. And you know, it's often a draw, and often the students win. I am not a, fr I, I do not pretend to know it all. I'm not one of these teachers that it's, it's my way. I am always learning from kids, from the students. You know, Peter, I've learned a lot from you at, when you were in, in the class. So anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> you used to start your class off uh, every year with uh, an article from Harper's Magazine by uh, an author named Mark Sloka, uh, an article entitled Hitler's Couch yeah. about a graduate student who encountered an older woman who had a swatch of the couch that, that Hitler killed himself on. Um, which muses on the idea of the angel of history fluttering its wings and, and talks about how history can kind of arc across decades and, and centuries and, and kind of pop out at unexpected moments. Do you want to talk yeah. about that idea a little and, bit? And, and just to be uh, uh, honest about it, this 
you know, uh, we coached cross country together, and he did mention this reading today when we were at the cross country meet. And I haven't had it in the course for 10 or 15 years. I, I, again, it's one of these things that was there by Mark Sloka. It's a really interesting article, uh, Hitler's Couch. And one year, the stu uh, a student actually got in touch with Mark Sloka to find out whether it was a true story or not. And Mark Sloka got back. So that's another example of what happens in the classroom. But um, what I've done since is, uh, and, uh, and some of the more recent grads, um, Emmy back there would probably remember this. Um, uh, Gunter Gross is a very famous German author, best known for the tin drum. And um, in 2008, at the age of close to 80, he came out with a memoir uh, called Peeling the Onion. And what he did there is a little bit what Mark Sloka had done, and something that I'm really keen on persuading students about right at the beginning of the school year, and that is that you know, many young people believe that if it's history, it's over. It's not important. You know, we're moving forward. We're not looking back. And uh, so both Sloka and what Sloka uh, demonstrates in this story, Hitler's Couch, is that uh, the past and the study of it can result in what we call the uncanny, or the German word is unheimlichkeit. And that is that that which is uh, seemed to be familiar suddenly becomes unfamiliar. And that comes oftentimes from studying something that you think you know or a period you know a lot about. And then suddenly, if you study the past, the past then infuses that present moment and, and brings you to a place where you never thought you would be. It brings the past back into the present. And um, um, this is very much the case in Mark Sloka. He, he encountered this woman. He was so terrified when he saw this uh, swath of the, of the couch on which Hitler committed suicide, it had a blood stain on it, uh, that he ran out of the apartment building and was running down the street, right, he down the alley. Sprinted to the subway. Well, yeah. quickly, Gunter Gross, on the other hand, he represented the conscience of Germany. He said Germany needs to confront its past. It cannot, mo it can't move on. It can't go forward until it truly confronts the past. And the first generation, when you experience trauma, the, the tendency is to repress, um, not to address it. And we see this when we study German history, that the first generation just is unwilling to talk about it. Uh, Gunter Gross's mother during, uh, would not talk to her son about what happened to her during the, the Nazi period. But when the war was ending, he found this out from his sister later, when the war was ending, and the Russians were coming into Germany. They raped over two million German women. And one of the women they raped was Gunter Gross's mother, who presented herself to the Russian soldiers to protect her daughter. Um, so um, this is something that Gunter Gross only found out later on. Now, what was amazing about Gunter Gross is he was telling the German people they've got to confront the past. It turns out in his memoir when he turned 80 is that he was a member of the SS and he had lied about it all these years. And so he was being told by any number of people that you need to return the Nobel Prize for Literature, which he won for the Tin Drum uh, and other writings of his. And um, it, we wonder to this day, why did he wait that long to come forward with the admission of what he had done during World War II? You read this memoir, and it's, it's a remarkable work. I, I strongly recommend it. Um, but I think that what Gunter Gross, and this is what we try to discuss with the students, and they've written essays about it, uh, and that is that Gunter Gross wasn't looking to be forgiven. He wasn't looking for exoneration. He felt as he approached his death that he had to come clean on this. Now, did he return the Nobel Prize for Literature? And maybe many of you think he should have. He did not. And so that's part of the debate we have in class. And uh, there is no right or wrong answer. Um, uh, a, a very strong-willed, strong, -willed, strong uh, purposeful student in, ter in terms of character is a girl by the name of Natalie De Beer, and she just in no way was willing to forgive or forget. Now, uh, and he, she said he should return the Nobel Prize, um, but she was one of the few. Emmy, do you remember you, where you were on that? You don't remember? Okay, well, that's, yeah, I could make 
I, I could have something funny to say about that, but I'll pass on it. Go ahead. You, um, you teach a lot of um, both, both your sophomore uh, history class as well as your uh, senior history electives, um, looking at kind of snapshots of major figures, uh, particularly of the last 150 years or so of European history. Um, why, why do you focus so much on individuals, especially after uh, the, great, the 19th century great man theory has kind of yeah. gone out of fashion? Yeah, I'm, I'm still, um, I, I, I'm somebody who's growing up who's always looking for heroes. So uh, I do admit that the great man theory or the great woman theory of history is passe, but you know, I, I was always looking for heroes. So when I was a kid growing up, Willie Mays was one of my heroes. He's probably the, the hero for me. And um, uh, Chuck McGivern gets a kick out of this. I was a really good kickball player. And the kids, I wore Willie Mays' baseball picture on my shirt, uh, all crumpled up, went through the wash a number of times for the entire fifth and sixth grade. And I was a really good kickball player, and the kids would call me Willie Mays with the magnetic hands. <laughs> Chuck McGivern just cannot figure this out, you know. This, and then I made a fool out of myself in a student-faculty game, right, didn't I? Yeah, okay, I missed the ball. But anyway, I grew up just f looking for heroes, and, you know, it could be my pastor, it could be, but it was ultimately Willie Mays. So I would clip out uh, his uh, results from the previous night in the game and I had all these pictures and clippings and so forth and uh, my mother then made uh, a collage out of it and hung over my bed and so it hangs over uh, my classroom Willie Mays so um, it's just um, it's and, and by the way in class one thing I did excel out excel at I talked a lot talked too much and I would get up in front of the class and recreate the exploits of Willie Mays the previous night. I would actually run across the room and slide into the base, you know, what I thought was a base. And uh, so I've always had that interest in great individuals. So whether it's somebody like a Michelangelo uh, or Winston Churchill, I mean, and they can be of either political persuasion. It's just what kind of character did they have? You know, what, what were they about? What did they, what did they overcome? What did they stand up to? And I think, you know, students today really need to have heroes. Um, and um, I'm unashamedly um, behind that effort. Now, at the same time, uh, take Winston Churchill, many, many warts, many, many issues that he should have addressed more justly that he did not. Um, particularly in his treatment of India and his thoughts about Gandhi, who's one of my heroes. I mean, he had nothing good to say about Gandhi. But I think something else I loved about, for example, Churchill is his sense of humor, uh, incredible sense of humor. And I think many of you know some of his anecdotes, right? Yeah, I don't, you don't need to hear one. Okay. You also um, teach an awful lot of, of the course of continental history um, through the lenses of both art, fine art, and of architecture. Um, what leads you to use those as kind of the channels um, through which students wind up learning about this history? Yeah, another, another work that kids are working on right now is they've been, um, they've uh, studied very, very carefully two structures in Berlin again. One is uh, uh, Daniel Liebeskind's The Jewish Extension to the Berlin Museum. Casey's shaking his head yes. Emmy, you better remember that. Okay. Okay, um, and uh, by the way, Liebeskind did the Ascent building down uh, just across the river in Kentucky. If that, it goes up, you know, like, like a curve. And uh, Eisenman, Peter Eisenman, who did the DAP building in Cincinnati, he did the national, in Berlin, the National Holocaust Memorial. So my view of it is that buildings tell stories. And so if you're, thinking about ancient Rome, I mean, immediately you think of the Colosseum or the Pantheon. Uh, if you think about the French Revolution, you might think of Versailles. So buildings tell stories, and what I find so fascinating about this Daniel Liebeskind is he uh, did, I think, one of the great structures of the last 
30 years, and it's uh, the Jewish extension of the Berlin Museum. So uh, again, what we get at there, uh, the most interesting aspect of that particular architect, uh, uh, the architectural work, is he has six voids, voids, just empty spaces in the museum, and they represent the six million Jews. And um, so you know, what architect is going to get a commission in which there are six voids in a building? And there's actually no front door to the building either. You have to go through the Berlin Museum underground to get into the Jewish extension. So the students begin to talk and, and, and try to figure out what the architect was trying to get at. And by doing that, we begin, again, understand different levels of history and what people's points of view um, might be. And then the Peter Eisenman uh, uh, work is, is uh, a huge 4,200, well now it's down to 3,000 pillars of a, kind of a park that you walk through and it's to elicit thoughts about the Holocaust. It's very, very famous. But art, art itself, uh, is that my sense is that when an artist is, puts the, you know, the paint on the canvas, I mean that work then becomes, it's a primary source. I mean you're back at the time when that artist worked. And I think artists are the most sensitive. They're like the seismograph. Of, of the past. I mean, they pick up what's going on, what the major issues are before anybody else. And then I like students looking at art and trying to interpret it, or a building and trying to interpret it. Um, I want students to be more alert to the built environment. I want them to walk through, you know, the world that they're in and with their eyes open and get to do everything I can to activate curiosity. So we even study this building and uh, decide students have just, and my city's course, have just written a paper on the degree to which this, the whole architectural setting of this school and its landscaping and everything else, to what degree it serves the school's mission. Was it done in a thoughtful way? And I, I'm going to say, I know some people are not wild about this architect's, architectural style, that it's very modern, it's very contemporary. I think personally, and again, this is something we debate in, in class, I think it, it suits the school's mission very well. So I'm a big advocate of Michael McInturf uh, and what he's done for this school, working with different heads like Charlie Clark and, and, uh, and Rob McRae. And, and then if I had a hat on, I would take it off to Tony because we ran into lots of delays with the North Campus Project and Peter and, you know, I'm, I mean, it, Mr. Pettengill, I mean, just incredible delays, but it's going to be phenomenal, and it does suit the school's mission very, very well. Uh, so um, this is something students uh, are studying. I want them to be sensitive to the built environment. Great. Well, so we've sort of pivoted from, uh, from Europe to, mm -hmm. to here. Um, what, why did you come to Country Day? What brought you here from a New England... Um, a New England boarding school setting. Yeah, well, so when I got out of, um, when I was trying to finish my uh, PhD dissertation, I'm, I'm an ABD, all but dissertation. And Mary Grace, who got her PhD at Northwestern, I, you know, we've shared some stories, and you would, she's in Northwest, she was at Northwestern, I'm at the University of Chicago, and we're of a different generation. But evidently, it's still the case at University of Chicago based on the relationships you had with students who were graduate students at the University of Chicago, that students at the University of Chicago very seldom finish their dissertations. They get no support. Um, and so um, I you know, had not completed my dissertation. The job market in college was very, very tight. And so um, high school teaching at a private school, and I don't want to sound like an elitist, but in this sense, I will be one. Uh, this school is committed to academic excellence, and I, there's no apology for that. Uh, I think this school, one of the things I love about this school is how diverse it is, and that we do extend so much in terms of um, uh, um, opportunities for students from all kinds of backgrounds to go to this school through scholarships. Um, but uh, academic excellence was what I was looking for, and I had to find it in a, in a 
private school. I mean, that just seemed to be where it would be most likely to be found. So I went to this boarding school. Sue and I had just gotten married. Uh, our very first piece of furniture we bought was this big sofa. And the very first, I think it was like, was it the first day or the first week, this kid came into our uh, apartment. He couldn't breathe. His jaw was open. And he proceeded, and this is a boarding school, he proceeded to throw up all over this sofa. This was our first, first piece of furniture. I mean, it was just buckets. I mean, I, I, I got a plate out, and we're, uh, uh, it was just a mess. And it turned out that this kid was at the, some kind of pizza parlor next door, and he had been, um, they had been, uh, they had lit cigarettes, and they were shooting them into their mouths and trying to catch them lengthwise. And his jaw locked, and he swallowed the, the cigarette. And so he, this is why he was sick. He was throwing up. An ambulance came and took him away. And so we had this sofa for the next six years with a big stain in the middle of it, you know. Um, and so there were a lot of stories like that at a boarding school. I loved it. I loved boarding school. Um, but we wanted to raise... Uh, our children, like Catherine, uh, away from a boarding school. Um, the other side of the wall in, of our apartment uh, was the boys' bathroom. So we'd wake up every morning to hearing these boys, you know, doing their thing. So we came to, okay, so I um, a, you know, did a national search, and John Rauschenbusch, and, you know, I admire him so much. I mean, he's just the epitome. I mean, I, you know, he's the one who hired me, so obviously I'm going to have a soft spot in my heart for John Rauschenbusch. But uh, they flew me out here. I took a look at the school. I liked it very much. I took the job. Suzanne was willing to come to the Midwest from Connecticut, reluctantly, but came. And um, she's been uh, a family nurse practitioner down at Children's Hospital and has worked with the Spaths uh, for a long time. And um, um, I've just loved the school. I mean, I got involved in athletics, coaching, which I think is very important. I could say a lot about that, uh, how important I think it is to be with the kids outside the classroom. Um, you know, in this age of ours in which there is so much tribalism, um, I think it's great to be tribal when it comes to sports and to be competitive, but I think it's great to have teachers from Country Day coaching because we can rein that in when we have to and explain to kids that, you know, we need to treat one another and be good sports. And, I mean, there are some schools that I will not name that we go up against that supposedly have a commitment in their mission to good sportsmanship, and they just don't exhibit it. It's very, very rare at this school with people like Hirschauer coaching, uh, Greg Ross. Uh, sometimes Howard Brownstein got a little out of control, but he, <laughs> um, he was fine. Tim Dunn, Pat Dunn. Um, you know, I could go on and on. These are people, and, and Hirschauer really does stand uh, apart in terms of what she's brought to the school in terms of a gr great competitive nature, but really committed to sportsmanship at the same time. Um, so we came here and just fell in love with the place. And uh, the Midwest and the people that I work with here and the students are just phenomenal. I'd like to say more about the students. Do you have a question about the students? Yeah. I'll let you frame I, it how you'd I've like. I've been here 30, so this is my 31st year. A, a couple things I want to say about this. This is pretty remarkable. It's a strange statement I'm going to make. I, I do make some strange statements. Um, you all knew in, what you were in for in, when you came. In my 30 years here, I have never, in the building now, I've never seen uh, two students kiss one another. Never seen it. No PDA. Now, and I don't know, those of you who are parents, I think you approve of that. I don't, I, I, I don't think, <laughs> so my daughter's boyfriend is Tyler Spaeth, and um, they did go to school here together. I never saw them, I've never seen them, I, I never saw them kiss one another here in school. I, PDA at this school is not approved of by the students themselves. Um, and I've talked to other kids where, even middle school kids that have been at other schools that I won't name, where at the beginning of the day, they're, they're sitting along the hallways, making out. 
Um, and I've asked students here, why is there no PDA here? And they say, well, we've been here since we were little. We're more like brothers and sisters. They say that. They also say we're just too doggone busy with our academics. Uh, I mean, they've got things to do. And again, when I was in high school, again, I probably shouldn't mention this, particularly in front of my wife, but the high school I went to, um, that's what it was all about. You exchanged rings. Uh, I had a girlfriend by 10th grade, and we, made, we found places to make out in high school. And you'd come into school, you'd have these hickeys. You know what a hickey? I mean, so people sucking on each other's necks. Okay, I have never seen a hickey at this school. Um, so students, students are really committed to this school. Another thing, I, uh, we, don't, we don't monitor the kids every second of the day. So, I mean, they can, the hallways here, one of the things I love about the hallways is the width of the hallways. The hallways are used as gathering places. Uh, kids sit there, they work together, they tell stories or whatever. I mean, it, and uh, it's just, this is such a humane environment. Again, it's not one of these schools where you have to sign out to go to the bathroom, that you're always being told where you need to be every minute of the day. If the, the kids during the day go down to the terrace and get a cup of coffee or tea or an apple, I mean, this is the way it ought to be. Um, you see kids, you know, sitting on the commons spaces. I mean, it's a very open school that was done intentionally so that kids uh, can spend time getting to know one another. You don't have these small corridors that become places where often you're running a gauntlet. Um, it's just a, a very uh, warm and nurturing place to learn. But at the same time, and the, the relationship between the students and the faculty is great. In my 30 years here, um, I don't recall ever taking a student to the dean. I mean, I, it's just, we have occasionally uh, missteps on the part of students, but it's very, very rare. Um, I mean, we really are engaged in shared learning here. I mean, it's, we're getting students prepared to go to college. Students here say it's cool to be smart. And it's just a sad statement that many young people in many schools uh, would not say that. Um, and so, um, you know, you go on and on about the students, but they're fantastic. They're just, they, they value the teachers, um, and the teachers value the students. It's, it's just a very warm experience. If I see Casey out someplace, you know, um, at a mall or something, I mean, uh, he's not going to run away from me. He's going to say, hey, Mr. Black, you know, we might even give each other a hug. I mean, we, we've bonded over the years, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. And I want to say your son was just fabulous at, in cross country, on the basketball court, in class. Just one of the real incredible kids at this school. You've already touched um, a little bit on this, but I wonder if you'd uh, talk some about your relationship with your colleagues uh, and particularly focus a little bit on your uh, long friendship with uh, Pat and Tim Dunn. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Ashley told me that maybe I shouldn't just focus on the Duns, but I mean there is this tendency to uh, uh, pair me with the Duns, and uh, and that's inaccurate. Um, I I have such good relationships with Mary Grace. I'm and Chuck. I'm you know I'm really honored that you're here, um, and but it is true that I've w worked with the Duns for. Uh, all these 30 years. And Tim Dunn is a hard nut to crack. I mean, he, he really, he, so I was coming from Cheshire Academy, which is not known in New England to be one of the strong boarding schools. <clears throat> and so he couldn't figure out why uh, this school would hire me, you know, coming from Cheshire Academy. So he really had nothing to do with me for the first year. And then at the end of the year, he invited Sue and I to his home in Oakley, and he made an incredible meal. So if, if he's somebody that I admire deeply, uh, and Pat as well, she and I have had a few rocky moments, but who hasn't with Pat Dunn? You know, I mean, it just, um, but uh, he's just, he's a man's man. 
Um, he, again, how many schools have somebody who is a uh, AP biology teacher, chair of the department, and this phenomenal football and baseball coach? And he knew how to coach, and he knew how to bring the best out in his athletes. And it was always clear to his athletes that this wasn't about Tim Dunn, that they're not going out there to win for Tim Dunn, that he was there to support them so that they could reach their uh, potential and their objectives. Whatever their objectives were, he supported them. Uh, just he's, I think, I, I'm sorry, but I think he's the smartest guy on the campus. I mean, just sheer smartness. And Pat Dunn's not far behind. Um, I've, so I, they're very, very dear friends. But I've said this, and it's more or less true. In the 30 years I've known them, I've never received a compliment for either one of them. They, they, no compliments. You know, they just, they just not interesting compliments. Um, what, what I'm really excited about, though, is that the, the younger faculty that are coming up that are going to, they're going to, you know, the Duns and Black are going to be an afterthought, and it's going to be people like Mary Grace and Chuck, and that are going to, you know, they're going to be, they mean so much to the school now, and it's just going to be more and more and more with every year that passes. So um, the Duns are just fascinating people. I mean, I think in some sense they're irreplaceable. They're so bright. Uh, they're tough. They're tough on students. I mean, um, uh, I mean, you, you, you can't have a thin skin with them. And I, with Pat Dunn, for example, she's such a good teacher of writing. And it's very difficult for students to take criticism about their writing. I mean, very difficult. It's very personal. It doesn't stop her. And my feeling about it has always been that if Pat Dunn corrects your writing, uh, you should thank her. I mean, this is what you want. You just want somebody to put an A on your paper? I mean, so she's tough. And uh, that's, that's, again, what sets this school apart. We have kids doing lots of writing. From my point of view, one of the most important things that you learn at this school, apart from this, this, all this hoopla about STEM, is that kids learn to write. Um, uh, Kyle Kissinger, I don't know, maybe he was born with it, but that guy can write. He can really write. Yeah, he's, he can really write, and he learned some of it here at this school. Um, how, how has Country Day changed over the years? You've seen a lot of uh, division heads, a lot of heads of school, and even been, if you include the, the year in the trailers, you've been in three, uh, <laughs> three, three pretty different learning environments as well. Yeah, well, I've said something about John Rauschenbusch, who I just admire, and I admire those people that were here before I got here. Uh, Lee Pattison, um, those of you who had the good fortune to know that man, I, that, I, when I arrived here, it was his last year I, when I interviewed. And I thought I would love to have had the opportunity to teach with him for a year because, boy, did he love kids. And the, he had some spiritual uh, center to him that kids just really recognized and honored. Um, and just there's so many others. Uh, you know, your father, Bill Hopple Jr., just phenomenal human beings. Um, um, and, you know, again, John Rauschenbusch, who uh, uh, means so much to me and I think has meant so much to this school. But what I've seen in the heads, so if we go from John to Charlie uh, Clark to Rob McRae to now Tony Giacacci, is that they were all different. Um, um, but one of the things I've seen that each one is capitalized from the other on is this school has become... It's maintained its commitment to uh, academic rigor and high standards, academic excellence. But at the same time, it's become a kinder place, um, more nurturing. Um, and that's been done intentionally. Uh, it didn't just happen by accident. And, well, absolutely. Absolutely. That had a lot to do with it. And there was, there was a transition there that was difficult for some you know, during that period. But I can't tell you, and yes, you could speak to this much more accurately than I can, but when I got here, what I heard, and um, there, are, there are students who went here in the late 70s, early 80s, who now have decided that they're, 
they were reluctant to send their children here because of the experience they had. And it was during that transitional period. And when I got here, there was still some of that. But what the heads have done with the board is you know, consciously um, created a school in which um, we care about one another. And um, um, it's, it's, um, it's, it, you just have to be here to see it, to experience it. But uh, you know, teachers are not coming down on kids uh, in ways that oftentimes you see in an authoritarian situation. That's just not what it's about. Uh, the teachers here care deeply about the students. And as I said before, the students care deeply about the teachers. Um, and um, so I give an enormous amount of credit to the, to the uh, heads of school. Um, and I don't know about you know, the, a lot of what happens, Tom, at the board level, I'm unaware of. Chip, I'm unaware of. But it was clear to me, Peter, that this was something that you all decided to do together. And um, I, I, I think another thing, I, I was talking to, again, a, the local public school uh, today at uh, the cross country match. And she told me, she's been at the school forever, that we've been through, I think she said, four superintendents, uh, seven principals, on and on and on about the administration, just the last like 15 years. And what we've had here are four uh, heads and, and oftentimes division heads that have served a long tenure. And uh, so I think that kind, of, that kind of consistency allows those heads to leave a mark on the school, to create a legacy. And so, I, I mean, I would say to Tony, you have at least six or seven more years here. I mean, you, you've got to stay that length of time. Because this, it, it's difficult when you have a change in leadership. Uh, um, and I, again, I think the school did a great job, Chip, in, in bringing Tony here. I mean, he's just what we needed, just what we needed. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, that was fun, yeah. Is it exciting for you to see uh, second and third generation students coming up through? Yeah, and you know, many of you who are here, practically all of you, uh, it seems to me, are uh, second generation or third generation or have a connection to that. And um, it's, it's strange, you know, again, every person's time here individually is, is, is limited, it's marked by time. But the idea that uh, a family will continue to support this school and be committed to it for more than one generation says so much about your belief in the school. Do schools have hiccups? Do they have uh, at times when things don't go as well as you would have hoped? Absolutely. But uh, that continued commitment to the school because the school lives up to its mission, uh, that it's always striving to meet that mission and even you know, surpass it is something that um, means so much to me. So you know, again, I'm, I'm praying, again, I'll just go back to the Kissingers for a moment. I'm praying that the, one of those two Kissinger boys will come back here to Cincinnati and uh, send his children to this school. I, you know, I talked to uh, quite a few individuals last night who have made the decision as alums to send their children back here. And I don't know what it is, but I just, I'm just very happy about it. I mean, it's just, it's a real uh, celebration or a real uh, indication of their commitment to this place. And if they are not sending their children here, I make myself a bit of a pest. You know, I ask them, why not? Please, you know. Um, um, and so, yeah, it's extremely important, I think, to the school that you have that kind of multi-generational commitment to the, to the institution, yeah. Because, you know, the school, it, lots of people think that, that a school, a private school is just, you know, here we are in Indian Hill, that it's just a wash in money. And the fact of the matter is that the school operates on a, sh a shoestring budget. I mean, we're close to the bone. And, uh, and uh, so it's so important that families remain committed to the school and, uh, and alums do as well. Because this institution, from my point of view, is one of the most important institutions in Cincinnati. And again, it's something I liked about what Tony said when he interviewed here. Well, probably the first thing he said was he's excited about the upcoming 100th year anniversary. So Tony was aware of the history of the school. 
Um, and I can't overstate um, that communities, cities need institutions that, um, that, that aspire to greatness and that they pass on uh, that greatness from one generation to the next. Um, that's, that's what a school like this is about and it needs the support of, of everybody. And the school has done such a good job of becoming more diverse. And that's, that's come at a cost. And uh, those of us who are faculty have sacrificed in some ways because we think it's, it's so important that the school is diverse, socioeconomically and, and racially. It's so important, um, as is, and I'm just uh, to capitalize on the statement, maybe in a more self-centered way, uh, tuition remission for faculty children. Um, you know, there are some families who think that, that that's uh, a luxury maybe a school can't afford. I, I just couldn't disagree more. I mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm a testament to the idea that, um, you know, when, when my children graduated from here, I just didn't fly away. I am eternally grateful to this place for the education my children got here that they would not have gotten because teachers don't make a lot of money. And so one of the benefits of working here is that the community comes together and says, we want your children, you, you teachers, we want your children here at the school if it's, a good, if it's a good fit. And so as a result, I wanted to coach. I want to be here till 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening because my children are here and they're part of a community. Uh, if, if there wasn't tuition remission, um, I would be gone. Teachers would be gone to go to where their children are. So um, I think I'm rambling a little bit here, aren't I? But um, it's, it's what I have found here is a real sense of community. And um, people that, I mean, the, what you've done with the opening up the Chinese New Year to this faculty, to this school, to this community, it's just wonderful. Um, uh, and uh, it just really does take a lot of people to make this place go. And, uh, it's a very open place, yeah. I think there are very few people who um, cast a larger shadow, and certainly none who cast a longer shadow on the history of this school than Tony Strauss. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd talk about him a little bit. Yeah, yeah. T Tony, it was, it was a tremendous loss to the school when he suddenly died because he knew, he knows everybody. And his, his uh, father was the architect of the building that existed when I came here, and it's still very much um, the lower school. And he taught here for, I think it's 42 or 43 years. And he went to school here as well. Um, and he is an incredibly kind individual. Um, and he would uh, invite young faculty, something maybe the blacks and the duns don't do enough of. I mean, he. He invited faculty into his home all the time. I mean, that's where we congregated. That's where we talked about the school, both in a positive way and a negative way, things that needed to be improved. Um, it was a very free-flowing space, and uh, it meant a lot. Uh, Tony Strauss is one of the giants of the school, you know, along with Lee Pattison is somebody. Dave Walsh is another one. Um, these are people that just gave so much to this place and believe me they they got a lot from it you know that's what i would say about myself we're even we're even i'm still indebted i mean we're even but we're i'm indebted yeah what do you hope your 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 long time legacy will be here uh, at country i haven't Day? really given it much thought i mean people ask me when i'm going to retire and uh it uh, catherine and elizabeth have told me that uh, they'll let me know when I'm slipping. Maybe, maybe, maybe some of you maybe have reached that conclusion now. I don't know. But uh, uh, I love what I'm doing. I'm taking it a year at a time. It depends on my health. In terms of legacy, I'm, I'm just not concerned about that at all. I mean, again, as I said, we're even. Um, I'm really excited about Mary Grace and Chuck. I, I'm, I'm really uh, excited about you know, you perhaps coming back to this school, maybe, uh, again, Emmy, you know, teaching, what do you think? Peter, I'd love if you were teaching at this school. So if, if that would be a legacy. 
if somebody like Peter came back to teach at this school, somebody who I had taught, um, that would really be meaningful to me. But beyond that, I, have, I, I haven't given it a thought. It, 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 does, it means very little to me. Yeah. Well, we still have